a year without rain. Counting the days, confused and dazed, trying to get out, but this is a maze. I'm stuck in a wonder, a cell for my slumber, on a plain white sheet and a wool one for my cover. This isn't cool, I don't like it here, but the change has to start with the man in the mirror. But until then I cannot complain, I have to change up and get in my lane. Black walls stare at me, I'm going insane, cause a day in here is like a year without rain. Angel is one of nearly 70,000 young students who on any given day is incarcerated in America's juvenile justice systems. The demographics are eye-opening. 68% of student inmates are youth of color. 87% of them are male. Jails are the end of a pipeline that starts with discipline. All across the country, students from K through 12 face punishments that remove them from the classroom. Black students are disproportionately affected by these measures. During the 2011 to 2012 academic year alone, three million public school students received an out-of-school suspension. And 130,000 students were expelled entirely. For students out of the classroom and in and out of prison, what does the future hold? Please welcome David Domenici, Executive Director of the Center for Educational Excellence in Alternative Settings, and Kara McClellan, founder of Sisters Keeper Collective. Here to lead the conversation is Atlanta contributor Amanda Ripley. Thank you both for being here and thank sure. all of you. Um, just when you thought we were going to make things uplifting, um, we uh, well, I am glad we got to hear a poem from an actual student in one of these facilities from Angel. There are about as many American kids in these facilities right now as there are kids in DC public school system, in San Francisco's public school system, and yet we very rarely hear about their education. They're entitled to an education when they are in detention facilities. So what we're going to do is hopefully shine a flashlight on, I think spotlight would be too strong a word, so flashlight uh, on what, what is happening in these schools and why haven't we heard more about them. Um, David Domenici is the director of the uh, Center for Educational Excellence in Alternative Settings. Before that, he, uh, way before that, in 1997, he uh, helped start a public charter school called Maya Angelou here in DC for court-involved students. And it was such a success that the city asked Maya Angelou to take over the school at Oak Hill, which is DC's longer-term detention center for juveniles and was known as one of the worst juvenile prisons in the country. Um, so he has been at this for a very long time from different angles, um, does many things, but I guess what I wanted to start with, David, is, uh, and then we're going to get to Kara, I wanted to start by asking David, um, what, with all the things we've heard about today and the education reform movement and all the turmoil and debates and fights and money and research, ha has all of that been mirrored in the juvenile detention schools that you go to? Is the same thing happening there? Uh, for the most part, no. <laughs> so the good news is, uh, the juvenile justice reform movement has been extraordinary. There's only about half as many kids locked up around the country as there used to be 10 years ago. Kids aren't getting, generally getting beat up. They're mostly safe. Uh, but no one has really tackled the education side of the puzzle. And the reasons for that really are twofold. One, I think sort of philosophically, um, these are our bad kids or troubled kids. They're gone and forgotten. They're thrown out of the cities. They're just out of mind, out of sight don't deserve our attention. And then secondly, the schools and youth facilities are just, I, I, I use the word like off the accountability grid. Mm -hmm. Many of them run, are run by state juvenile justice agencies and they're just, no one knows who, who's accountable for performance there. Other, about another half of the schools are run by local school districts. Um, but again, with the, when No Child Left Behind first came through, there was, most of these schools were just given an exemption. They were alternative schools. No one thought they knew how to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. And they've really just been lost and forgotten. Hmm. But we're going to get there. Right. No, we're turning the corner tomorrow. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, no, but there is some room for hope, and, and we'll talk about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, 
Kara McClellan is the founder of uh, My Sister's Keeper Collective in Philadelphia that does one-on-one -on -one advocacy with girls, helping them navigate the, the system. There are different systems, education system, criminal justice system, generally kids who have too many systems uh, interfering with their lives. Uh, can you kind of walk us through it? But, but before this, Kara's, one of the interesting things about Kara's perspective is she's seen this problem from different angles. She has... Um, worked as a teacher at a middle school in Philadelphia with significant violence issues, and she has worked as a lawyer representing uh, kids who were going through expulsion proceedings. Um, so can you kind of help us understand how do kids get to these facilities? Like, how, how, how do we end up there? How does that happen? Um, well, in some situations, you know, when you're teaching, a lot of times you don't think about what happens to kids after they are expelled from a school, um, and it really is gonna depend on the state where they end up. In some states, literally, there's an hour of education a day or less for kids who are expelled, so they're in no facility. Um, for some, are in alternative settings. Um, some, if they picked up a juvenile charge as a result of the incident that led to their expulsion, they could be in a juvenile facility. And for some, um, which I wanna talk about, who are also out of the accountability grid, um, who are placed in facilities as a result of a neglect and abuse proceeding um, and may be receiving their education in that facility. Um, but, you know, for example, we're working with girls who are getting educations in group homes where they're 6th through 12th grade all in the same room. Um, and so this is another setting where kids, are, their education is being interrupted. They are no longer in the community. In a lot of situations, these are not kids who have committed any offense. Um, but as a result of state involvement are now in facilities where they're not receiving the education that they should be getting. Hmm. So they've done nothing wrong, but they're still in this kind of invisible zone. Um, Kara, why does My Sisters Collective focus on girls? I mean, most of the, most of the kids are suspended, most of the kids who are arrested are boys. Um, why have you decided to focus on girls? Well, um, if we, we were having this conversation 10 or 15 years ago about the school to prison pipeline, I think for a long time the emphasis was on boys and on boys of color, and you know that is a significant um, amount of the population who is um, experiencing the school to prison pipeline. Recent research has really shown that girls are significantly impacted as well. Um, about a fifth of the people who young people who are involved in the juvenile justice system are girls. Um, and really, research has shown that we should be targeting this population in a unique way because, um, well, first of all, girls are more likely to have mental health diagnoses who are involved in the juvenile system. Eight out of 10 girls who are involved mm. have a mental health diagnosis. Girls are more likely to have a, a history of sexual abuse, mm -hmm. one third of girls who are involved in the juvenile justice system have a history of sexual abuse. Um, and girls are more likely to be what we call a part of the crossover population who have been involved in the child welfare system and then become involved in the juvenile justice system. So really a marginalized group of young people who we really need to be targeting in a specific way in order to address what's going on in their lives. One of the most surprising statistics I saw recently was that um, black boys are suspended at three times the rate of white boys, which is shocking. Black girls are suspended at six times the rate of white girls. Um, so it's a complicated problem, but it has not gotten enough attention until very recently, I think. Um, so I guess I wonder, I mean, if we could kind of maybe help people see inside the, these places that are, that, that are really closed off um, to the public and to visitors usually. What, David, could you, I, I know that you and a colleague um, a year or two ago visited 30 different facilities and observed about 150 different classes. What, what did that look like? What was the range of things that you saw? In, and see these, so these are juvenile detention facilities with schools in them, yeah? Ostensibly, yes. Ostensibly, yeah. schools, yeah. loosely defined. So, uh, so the bad news is, um, we saw something that we could classify as instruction in just over 50% of the classes. So instruction? Which means there was no instruction going on in approximately half of the classes that we went to. So let's not, let's not over-focus on that, but what does that look like? That mostly, lo that looks like 10, 15 young people in a room, uh, mostly with either uh, crossword puzzles or mimeograph sheets or maybe 
textbooks on their desks and um, an adult sitting, bu sitting behind a desk someplace. And, and that's what, that counts as class. Mm. Um, there are examples where you go into a room and you pick um, off a little clipboard uh, something that's you know in plastic, and if you complete the you know you have three of those, and if you complete those three, then you turn it in, you get credit for the day, and that's the scope of your instruction, and, and that that is what it is in many of these places. Um, now, now things are changing. There are some really terrific individual teachers around the country. And there are some systems. There are some systems that are putting things in place that are starting to produce consistent, high-quality education. The kids from the juvenile justice facility uh, school in Utah just won the statewide stock market contest. I just high school contest. I just found out yesterday. So they, they're whatever good things are going on in the school district, they're doing them. Hmm. They're doing them there. Um, we have students uh, in D.C. who are writing essays and giving speeches about like what's the right moral response to injustice and is, is violence appropriate response. Mm. We have kids in the Wyoming Girls School who are, um, people put out nationwide, uh, where we want students to try to develop 3D solutions to um, helping uh, facilitate you know, body parts and they're actually in their classes trying to design prosthetic devices and print them out on their 3D printers. And this, so it's happening, it's sporadic. Some of it happens in places like Utah where there's just really good articulated systems in place that expect teachers to deliver high quality. Hmm. Um, it also happens in other places because there's just really wonderful, dedicated uh, people doing this stuff. Zoila Gallegos, who uh, works in the juvenile hall in Los Angeles, has been doing this for years. She's a literacy instructor. and. She really believes in the power of literacy, the power of poetry, and if you show up in her class, you're gonna get high engagement, high relevance, you're gonna write, you're gonna produce, you're gonna speak. Hmm. And, and if, if I understand this right, your organization is trying to kind of replicate this, trying to, trying to expand good practices into all different facilities. How is that going? And tell us a little bit about uh, Words Unlocked. Sure. Um, you know, our success relates a little bit to what I just said. There's, there's really, there's massive system challenges here. One, one of the issues, again, is there's just a philosophical belief system challenge, which is, do these kids deserve high quality instruction? And the answer to that is oftentimes no. There's institutional sort of systemic problems. Um, students don't come to school because someone on the secure care, they were short of staff. And so they didn't come to school today. And no one thinks, but there's an extra staff person in that side of the facility. Why don't we have a process in place that when there is a shortage of staff, you pull a staff member? The, so there's these massive, there's just system challenges over and over again to try to make these places work for kids. But, but again, we're seeing some really great teachers um, light up when you could give them the right tools and put them in some networks and some peer networks. So we, we just finished our nationwide poetry contest called Words Unlocked. We've, kids from 31 states around the country submitting poems, writing poems. And, and why are we doing that? Because it's, you, you want kids to get exposed. You believe in the power of their voice. You believe in the power of producing literature. You want people all around the country to get a chance to read what they write. Um, and if you tune in tomorrow and if you tune in later in the week, we'll be announcing our winners and we're producing podcasts. And, it, and it's really beautiful and lyrical and, and sometimes just, just tragic. But it, you, you got to try to push this stuff and, and give people tools that can make the experience transformative. Yeah. And give kids and adults reasons, reasons to believe and to move on. One of the things I like about this particular poetry program is that it's not just, hey, kids, go write a poem. You, know, like you actually have a, a really rigorous curriculum, right, that suggests for each day of, is it like a month? It's yeah. Really, yeah. You know, specific things. So kids are really working with poetry, you know, you know, working and on reviewing and improving their own work, and so it's it's um, poetry is is the end result, but it is it is a very thoughtful program, um, which is nice to see. Um, 
Kara, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, I think, I know for me, it, it's easy to kind of read about the school to prison pipeline and about, you know, see these images of kids in these places and get really angry and kind of righteous and feel like, you know, why are we suspending and expelling kids? And, um, and, and I think that anger is justified. Um, but I also think it's important to maybe speak a little bit to why, the complexity of why this happens. I mean, so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a teacher before this, as a middle school teacher, and from, from the teacher's point of view, how it felt to be in a school with recurring violence. Sure, um, I had the very humbling experience of going from being a researcher on the school to prison pipeline to being a teacher um, and having a lot of the theories that I thought um, explained what was going on in the classroom really challenged. Okay, so um, let's freeze. What theory did you have going into the classroom from the research, like about what the problem was and how to fix it? So I, I had done ethnographic research and talked to students a lot um, and really came away feeling that a lot of the issues were relationship-based. Hmm. Um, and there's research to support this, that when, mm -hmm. when kids have strong relationships with the adults in their school, um, that discipline is working more effectively and that, that adults are less likely to rely on exclusionary discipline. Okay. Um, I think I totally underestimated the challenge of being the person in charge of maintaining order and safety for 25 to in some cases 35 almost kids in a classroom um, in a school that has historically been dangerous and violent. Um, and we see situations like, you know, recently in Wilmington, Delaware, where a young lady lost her life in a bathroom when she was jumped in the bathroom. Um, and when you're the adult in charge, it's a tremendous amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. You never want something like that to happen to one of your babies. They become your babies when you're their teacher. And um, so, you know, we don't want to underestimate the challenge um, that a lot of really good educators are facing um, in creating safe um, and healthy and happy environments for their kids. It's a lot of anxiety day to day. You told me a story, I, I, I'm putting you on the spot, so I apologize, but you told me a story about how you didn't like to enforce dress code violations, which I know would make kids all over the land happy, because I hear this <laughs> from kids all the time, the dress code violations, and they're often sort of disproportionately enforced against black girls. Um, there, and there's a lot of issues around dress codes, right? And kids talk about it a lot. Um, so you were, you were trying to kind of straddle this line, right, and be be reasonable, right? Um, can you tell us what happened? So I, uh, in particular, this was related to hoodies and wearing hoodies and, uh, you know, of course, all the stereotypes that go along with that. And, you know, I, first year teacher, felt like um, as long as kids are in their seat and learning and engaged, I'm less concerned about writing them up for wearing hoodies. Um, and then uh, one of our seventh graders was jumped in the stairwell and there was a videotape of what happened. Um, he had a trombone on him. The trombone was broken by the student who jumped him, he was beat up, and the student who attacked him was wearing a hoodie so low over his face that you couldn't see his face in the video and we couldn't figure out who it was um, in order to hold him accountable. Um, and you know, my, my principal kind of looked at me and said, this is why we have a dress code and this is why we enforce it. Mm -hmm. um, so th these are tremendous challenges. We're not um, you know, in no way mean to downplay the challenges that educators are facing and mm -hmm. committed educators. It's like you're torn in two almost in trying to do, to build these relationships but also ensure safety, right? Um, I want to open it up for questions and I want to just remind people that please, you know, tell us your name, be friendly, tell us your organization and please do keep it to a, an actual question um, because we, we have, you know, we want to make sure we get the most out of the time that we have left here. Um, while we're queuing up this first question, I just want to um, ask David, if you can, I, I alluded to hope and, and you, you alluded to some states that were Utah. You, we've talked a lot about Utah. Utah is, is a sort of a standout model in some ways. Do you feel like now that we've, we've reduced the population of incarcerated youth, this is maybe, this will now get more attention now that there's some level of stability in some of these systems, now we can focus on higher order <laughs> problems like education? I, uh, I really do. We've, uh, again, it's been a big, big push from the juvenile justice reform movement over the years. And uh, again, the facilities have a lot less violence. Um, we're, we're now at a place where kids just go there. And the, the problem is you take a 16 year old who's got serious trauma, who functions potentially at a fourth or fifth grade level, 
and you don't do anything positive for nine months, he doesn't come out any better prepared to be successful in the world. And we have to now move to the stage of saying, if we're going to have someone there for nine months, it's not about just doing harm. It's can we put the systems in place? Can we put the belief systems in place? Can we get the right people in there? So we can actually help this young person be prepared. Yeah, I was thinking about the, the kids you described where there's, there's like, they're just doing crossword puzzles or these yeah. worksheets and how, if you're already depressed or struggling with you know, addiction issues and you're already angry, I mean, how demoralizing it would be to have to do that every day. Um, so we have a question right here, please. Hi, my name is Laura. Um, I work at the NIH. I'm a child development researcher. Um, I just had a question, uh, kind of going off what you were just speaking of. Um, is there any special focus on that social emotional learning and like learning strategies um, in conjunction with the general education that happens in the juvenile settings? Um, since often the causes of youth's you know suspension, expulsion, crime can have that root in the social emotional state of mind due to trauma and things like that. Are there any strategies that are taught in conjunction with the general learning? Sure. So again, I think it's uh, you know this is uh, there's not a monolith here. It really varies by facility and by state. But for example, Missouri has an in incredibly robust therapeutic program that's widely known as producing, helping young people really develop the social emotional skills they need to be successful to, to sort of address challenges of their past, prepare themselves and ready themselves when they leave. And in the Missouri system, it's all very integrated school, group process, evening work, it all fits and works together. And again, in some of the more high functioning schools, school isn't all about academics. You might, in fact, you might be studying issues that relate to justice, power, trauma, violence, and, and therefore it can become a part of your learning. In some cases, it's done really poorly. In some cases, it's really, really great. Do we have another question? Um, I think I'm being flashed a sign that I can't read, but I'm going to, I'm, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to just wing it. Um, so, sorry. Um, I think we are up for our next panel. So I just want to thank David and Kara for doing this important work. And I want to thank The Atlantic for talking about this. We need to talk about it more. We need to bring it out into the light. So thank you all for being here. Thank you.